And I'm not kidding you. This was like something out of a movie. I got out, and there was tumbleweed blowing across the highway. And I pull up to this, this gas station, and a guy comes out, and I say, hey, how's it going? You know, and he just looks at me like it's been a really long time since he's seen a person. Um, and he, he just looks at me. I said, I'm looking for the closest gas station. And he kind of pointed, and he may have grunted a few other words, but I really don't remember them because he seemed like he was kind of angry to even see me. Thankfully, we were able to get out of there and find a gas station, but that was an interesting experience where a, kind of a cultural experience. I went into this place, and I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll find somebody friendly. But man, I was wrong. I felt like this guy was like, this, he's an outsider, and I don't want to have him here. It was a cultural experience, even within, you know, our own culture. Uh, Corey was telling me the other day about an experience he had a couple of years ago when he was in Europe. Uh, some of you guys will know what chacos are. Chacos are sandals that, you know, a lot of young people wear, especially on college campuses. You see people wearing chacos a lot. And Corey said there were students from Harding who were wearing chacos with his group in Europe. He said everywhere that they went, it seemed like people kind of gawked at them because their feet were showing. You know, it was kind of a, maybe a cultural faux pas they started to pick up on that their feet were showing. And he said kind of the, the kicker was when they were in Rome at the Colosseum. And they were, they were sitting there, their group, and they had their feet propped up on one of the seats. And a lot of them were wearing chacos. And there was an elementary class that was there on a field trip. And they walked by, and Corey said almost all of them just gawked at these students from the United States whose feet were showing. It was like this cultural faux pas. And they were disgusted, you know, because all of these Americans were showing their feet. Um, it, and it was a cultural experience, right, where something that's normal in one culture is obviously abnormal in another. Um, and here's a little bit more of a serious example, something that I think we're experiencing increasingly more in our own culture. So Preston had an experience a couple of months ago, on campus at Arkansas Tech, passing out flyers for an event that we were having for the Student Center. And it was at the Bell Tower in the middle of campus. And there was another group there as well that was passing out flyers. And so the wind blew, blew some of their flyers off. Some of the guys went and picked them up. And they noticed that it was for a club called Bi Gala, which is the bisexual, gay, and lesbian club on campus at Arkansas Tech. And they looked over, you know, at their booth, and they had uh, a trash can with them that had an incredibly lewd statement on it. And it was a little bit of a, of a cultural experience. And those things are becoming more and more common, I think you all will agree. And I would be surprised this morning if you're a follower of Jesus, uh, if you have not felt to some extent in the past several months or past several years that what have been our traditional views on sex and human sexuality are going more and more against the grain of where our culture is going. In fact, since I finished writing this sermon, the middle of last week, I've, I've seen three different things that kind of prove this point. Uh, the first is I got an email from the Barna Group on Friday about some new research that they had done, and I saw that uh, they discovered that over 50% of all American adults believe that it is a good practice to cohabitate before you're married. So now the predominant view among adults in our country is that it is a good practice to live with someone before you get, before you get married. And then I also saw on Friday on CNN that uh, President Obama designated the first national monument to the LGBT movement um, at the Stonewall Inn in New York State. And then I've seen articles over the last couple of days about Christian universities being added to these uh, shame lists. There was an article on the Christian Chronicle website about this, and uh, Bruce McClarty, President at Harding, was quoted as saying this. He said, some voices are calling for Christian schools to be expelled from the NCAA, and others are calling for Pell Grants to be denied to students who attend our universities. These attacks seem to be coming from every direction these days. And I saw a video just yesterday from the president of Biola University. There is a state legislation in the state of California being passed, uh, or the effort is being made to have it passed. And so you just see these things happening over and over and over again, and it seems like what has been the traditional view, the traditional teachings of the church on sex and human sexuality are, are uh, going more and more against the grain in the broader culture. 
And I think it's important to bring that up because this is a situation the church found themselves in in Corinth in the first century. In fact, it was probably much more challenging than what we're facing today because in Corinth in the first century, this was a first generation Christian church in the middle of a, an urban pagan city reaching people for Christ for the very first time. And we're going to look at a passage of Scripture, I think, that speaks to uh, this idea of human sexuality and sex in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. Um, and so if you've got a Bible this morning, if you would open there with us to study through this, this passage. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. We're just really thankful that you're here. But I just can't help but believe that some of these passages that we're going to be covering over the next few weeks that specifically talk about sexual immorality, and biblical teachings on sex, they just have to be some of the most crucial and relevant texts that we can study as the church, uh, given our cultural climate. And so I believe that God has a word for us this morning from his word. So just a, a few reminders as we uh, head into this text. The first is, I just want to remind you about the background in Corinth. Corinth was an incredibly diff difficult culture. Tim has talked about it, I've talked about it, but sexual sin in Corinth in the first century was just absolutely pervasive, especially uh, um, prostitution. Tim has mentioned the god Aphrodite and the prostitute temple that was in Corinth, and probably the kicker that tells us what the situation was like in Corinth actually comes from the book itself, and it's the passage that Tim taught last week, which is in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 and 2, where Paul says, a man is sleeping with his father's wife, and you are proud. A man is sleeping with his father's wife, and you are proud. And that gives you an idea of what the culture was like in Corinth. This is happening in the church, not in the broader culture, but in the church. And so let's read this passage together and see what God has to say to us uh, from his word this morning. I'm going to read the whole thing and then we'll spend some time talking about it. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 through 20. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ... And unite them with a prostitute. Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So the first thing that I want you to see in this passage of Scripture, there are two quotes uh, that Paul quotes to the Corinthians. And these are apparently things that Paul um, heard from the Corinthians, that they wrote to him, or these are cultural assumptions. And the first one comes at the very beginning of the passage in verse 12, where he quotes, I have the right to do anything. Apparently, this is an attitude from the Corinthians where they say, I can do whatever I want, right? Don't tell me what to do. I can do anything. And then the second one is in verse 13. He says, you say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. And essentially, the argument goes, I have an appetite for food, and so I eat. No problem. I have an appetite for sex, and so I have sex. No problem. And when I have an appetite, I'm going to fulfill that appetite. He says, and there's a separation of my heart, my mind, my spirit. It's just a physical activity. It's like eating dinner with somebody, running a mile with somebody. I've got an urge, and so it's going to be fulfilled. And Paul's going to address that later. But what I want you to see as we get into this passage is that this mentality in Corinth in the first century is very similar to our mentality in our culture when it comes to sex. 
Some stats I want to read to you from the book Good Faith by David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons. They say more than 50% of millennials, that's people 18 to 31-year-olds, agree that hooking up or having occasional sex with a friend or acquaintance is a low-risk way to meet sexual needs. And we see that a lot on college campuses. Pornographic material is now an $8 billion a year business in one of the fastest growing segments of the entertainment industry. And I know when you get into the billions, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to you. It doesn't make sense to me. But just to give you some perspective there, at $8 billion a year, that's on par with the bottled water industry in the United States, as well as those sales match up with all of the digital merchandise sales from iTunes. So we're talking about big business, and we're also not talking about all of the pornography that's available for free online, and we'll talk more about that um, here in just a minute. Among teens and young adults, they believe it is less immoral to view pornography than it is not to recycle. So in a list of immoral activities, uh, not recycling is believed to be more immoral than viewing pornography. Among teens and young adults, they believe it's less moral to view or uh, it really doesn't bother me, is their quote. More than half of you as teens and adults, it really doesn't bother me to use pornography. And here, I think, is really the only piece of evidence we need. I could have just said this. But in 2015, Playboy decided that they would no longer show fully nude pictures in their magazine. Um, and one of their chief executives, when he was asked about that decision, here's what he said. You're now one click away from every sex act imaginable for free. He says, it's just passe at this juncture. And so when you start to look at our culture, and we look at the, the culture in Corinth, and we look at our culture, I think for a lot of Christians, myself included at times, there's a general feeling of fear and sometimes uncertainty. You know, it was a year ago this past week that the Supreme Court uh, legalized same-sex marriage. And so since then, there's just been, it seems like weekly, news coming out about various things happening, and there's this general feeling, I think, of fear and anxiety that we have. And so for, before we go much further in this message, I want to offer a word of encouragement to you from this text. I want you to, to back up a little bit from where we started, and I want you to look at verse 9 of chapter 6. He says, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And these were the verses that I just kept seeing come across my news feed a year ago when this ruling came out. But I wish verse 11 would have been included. And that is what some of you were. Paul's talking about the church members, those who will be gathered with us in the end, in heaven, in the final banquet, in the kingdom of God with King Jesus. Because he says, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And here's the word of encouragement that I wanna to give to you this morning. As difficult as the culture was in Corinth in the first century, people were still reached with the gospel. People were still giving their lives to Christ in baptism. People were experiencing radical life change, sanctification and justification, and they were right with God, despite how difficult the culture was. And I understand the fear, and I understand the anxiety and the uncertainty, but we will still reach people in 21st century America. People will respond to the gospel. They will be baptized. They will experience life change. God is not done working in people's lives yet. And I think we need to recognize something. Historically, the church grows in the face of opposition from the broader culture. If you look at Acts chapter 5, it's opposition that comes against the disciples that causes the church to grow. They come up against opposition from the Sanhedrin, and then Stephen is stoned in chapter 6. And do you know that if there was never any opposition in Jerusalem, that the movement of God in the first century church may have never spread, but it was opposition that caused it to spread. In China, from 1983 to 1993, thousands and thousands of Christians were thrown in prison. Their homes burned. Did you know that that has jump-started incredible growth for the church in China? Today, it's growing rapidly, reaching 67 million people. Some of you will recognize the name Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson worked for uh, Richard Nixon 
in his presidency and was a part of the Watergate scandal. Uh, spent some time in prison but gave his life to Christ in 1973. He founded Prison Fellowship and became a leader among Christians with engaging in culture. And one of his uh, uh, pupils, a guy named Gabe Lyons, wrote the book I referred to earlier, Good Faith. And Gabe relates the story that he had with Chuck towards the end of his life. Gabe asked him this, How should the church be thinking about all these new issues that are raising so much debate? Like immigration, war, homosexuality, the environment, and so on. And Chuck answered, Gabe, you know these aren't new issues, right? Our church fathers dealt with every one of these issues. There isn't anything new your generation will deal with that hasn't already been wrestled down by the church. These aren't new issues. They're old ideas that recycle through history. Sure, they may present themselves today as more or less acceptable or extreme, but they aren't new. And I think some of us even kind of long for the good old days. Well, I want to give you some perspective on, on what maybe the good old days were like. J. Edwin Orr is a historian and a preacher, and uh, a guy named Pete Gregg quotes him in a book. And this is kind of a long reading, but I think it's something that we need, we need to hear. So J. Edwin Orr, a widely respected historian, in a message called Prayer and Revival, described the situation in America in the 1780s. Drunkenness was epidemic, and the streets were not judged to be safe after dark. And he says, what about the churches? The Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall, wrote to the Bishop of Virginia, James Madison, that the church was, quote unquote, too far gone to be redeemed. The great philosopher Voltaire averred, and the author Tom Paine echoed, Christianity will be forgotten in 30 years. Take the liberal arts colleges at that time. A poll taken at Harvard had discovered not one believer in the whole student body. They took a poll at Princeton, a much more evangelical place, where they discovered only two believers in the student body. They held a mock communion at Williams College, and they put on anti-Christian plays at Dartmouth. They burned down the Nassau Hall at Princeton, They forced the resignation of the president of Harvard. They took a Bible out of a local Presbyterian church in New Jersey and burnt it in a public bonfire. Christians were so few on campus in the 1790s that they met in secret, like a communist cell, and kept their minutes in code so that no one would know. It's hard to believe that this was taking place in America 200 years ago, but then, or continues, God intervened, and he did so by mobilizing his people to pray. A prayer movement started in Britain through William Carey, Andrew Fuller, John Sutcliffe, and other leaders who began what the British called the Union of Prayer. Hence the year after John Wesley died, the Second Great Awakening began and swept Great Britain. In New England, there was a man of prayer named Isaac Bacchus, who in 1794, when conditions were at their worst, addressed an urgent plea for prayer for revival to ministers of every Christian denomination in the United States. Churches knew that their backs were to the wall, All the churches adopted the plan until America, like Britain, was interlaced with a network of prayer meetings, which set aside the first money of each month to pray. It was not long before revival came. There was a Scotch-Irish Presbyterian minister named James McGready, whose chief claim to fame was that he was so ugly that he attracted attention. McGready settled in Logan County, pastor of three little churches. He wrote in the diary that winter of 1799, for the most part, was, quote, unquote, weeping and mourning for the people of God. Lawlessness prevailed everywhere. McGreedy was such a man of prayer that not only did he promote the concert of prayer every first Monday of the month, but he got his people to pray for him at sunset on Saturday evening and sunrise Sunday morning. Then in the summer of 1800 came the Great Kentucky Revival. 11,000 people came to a communion service. McGreedy hollered for help, regardless of denomination. Out of that second great awakening came the modern missionary movement and its societies. Out of it came the abolition of slavery, popular education, Bible societies, Sunday schools, and many social benefits. And this is how Pete Gregg ends. He says, utter hopelessness turn to renewal and restoration, could it happen for a new generation? And what, what J. Edwin Orr doesn't mention is that the American Restoration Movement also came out of that, the heritage that we belong to. And so I said, I know that's long, but I think it's important for us to hear this. Have faith, church. 
Have faith in God. The church is not going anywhere. We need to remember and recognize and have faith that Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, is sitting on the throne today, ruling over every nation in the world. And he has every resource at his disposal to do whatever he wants in our culture or any other culture. And let's not doubt that. We need to remember what Daniel knew when he was in exile, that the Lord God reigns over every kingdom everywhere, and he's the one that allows people to have power. So let's not be afraid. Let's have faith. Don't be discouraged. People were reached in Corinth in the first century, despite the fact that it was a very difficult culture. And people will be reached in 21st century America, despite the fact that it is a very difficult culture. I fear that we might be sending the message at times that if the right legislation isn't passed and the right person isn't elected, then all hope will be lost. No. As long as God is on our side, hope will never be lost. And we will reach people in our culture in the 21st century. I want you to look in this passage. I don't want this to be doom and gloom. I don't want us to be fearful But let's look at what we teach from this passage as faithful people who believe in the word of God. Look at verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him and spirit. So Paul says sex is not just this physical act. It's something so much more than just an appetite that you have. He says you become united with someone. The way that I like to explain it is that it's like a tree that grows into the side of a building, maybe an old dilapidated building. And to pull that tree out of that old building is going to do damage to both the tree and to the building because they've become one. And Paul is saying, listen, when you unite yourself with somebody and you pull away from them, you are hurting yourself. You are wounding yourself. He says this is not just some physical act. See, the mentality that our culture has that sex any way you want it is fine leads to people being hurt. It leads to heartache, anxiety, depression, loneliness, and insecurity. And Paul goes on. He says, flee from sexual immorality, which literally means run away. Now, I want to talk about this, the the word for sexual immorality for a second. Um, Some people might even argue that there's no explicit command in the Bible that suggests that people should refrain from sex outside of marriage, because this term sexual immorality is kind of a vague term. The the word that Paul uses is the word porneia, which is where we get our word for pornography, but it just means to have a sexual relationship with anybody outside the context of a covenant relationship um, with another person. And I'm defining covenant relationship as it's been defined from the beginning between a man and a woman. And Paul says to run away from that. He says to run away. This is one of those sins in the Bible. There's so few sins that, that Scripture says to run away from. It doesn't say stand up and try to fight it. It doesn't say try to resist it. Scripture says run away from it. Take drastic actions. And what does it look like to run away? Well, I have a friend who serves in, in college ministry who told me about a student he talked to recently who was struggling with pornography. And he got some counsel to take some serious and uh, drastic steps to remove that from his life. And so he left school in the middle of the week and went to his parents' house. You know, took a long drive in the middle of the week to go to his parents' house and confess to them that he was struggling with this because he wanted help. He was taking drastic steps. You know, we have college students who are dating, who have made the commitment not to ever be alone. You know, they've said, we want to, we'll have all the privacy that we need in the middle of a crowded restaurant. 
And so they've taken drastic steps to run away from sexual immorality. And for those of us who are married, this is not just something for for those who are single or for young people, but I've heard many people say that affairs don't happen just, you know, in a day. There's several choices that take place over a long period of time. Maybe it's a conversation that's about work, and then it becomes a conversation about you know, a personal conversation, and it lingers a little bit, and then it lingers a little bit longer. It turns into a coffee date, and then to a lunch date, and then before you know it, you know, there's an affair. Those of us who are married need to take drastic steps to flee from sexual immorality. We cannot be vigilant enough to protect our marriages and our families. We need to run away from sexual sin. And then he goes on. He says, flee from sexual immorality. Again, and then in verse 19, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And so there's really a couple of reasons why we run away. And the first one is, Paul says, you're hurting yourself because you are uniting yourself with someone when you sin sexually. But he says there's another reason, and that is if you are a follower of Jesus, he says your body is not your own. You serve a master and a king, and so your body is submitted to God's will and God's ways. He says, yes, don't hurt yourself, but you're submitted to the master. Your body is not your own. So what, what's the measure, or what's the the word for us as individuals as we read this passage. I think the first thing that we need to do is we need to trust God, take him at his word, and we need to run from sexual sin. We need to take drastic steps. I think about what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, if your arm causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Take serious steps to remove sexual sin from our lives. But here's the thing. We don't want to just call you to run away. We want to help you run away. We want to teach the truth about this, but we want to be a place of help and hope for you. We want to be the kind of church that's a 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 church that sees people coming to Christ and experiencing life change. And so you might need to be a part of our Celebrate Recovery ministry. That is there to help you. We would love for you to be a part of that if that could help you. Uh, Tim, our senior minister, is a counselor. If you need counseling, I know that he would love to talk to you. We're calling you to run away, but we also want to help you run away. And maybe this morning what you need to do is, is to confess. You don't have to do that to a lot of people. You don't even have to do that here if you want to talk with me or Tim or one of the shepherds or one of our other ministers or anybody here about a struggle. We would love to talk with you about that. Think of James 5, 16. It says, confess your sins to one another so you may be healed. There's healing that comes with confession. And so if you're struggling in this area of your life, let me just encourage you, don't leave without getting some help. Run away, and we want to help you run away. And then as we think about as a church, what do we do with the teaching of Scripture? How do we, how do we handle this as a church here and then as a church abroad? I think we've got to make an important shift in our thinking. And that's one that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 5. We can no longer be shocked when people who are not the people of God live as if they are not the people of God. We can't be shocked when the culture around us that doesn't know Jesus lives like they don't know Jesus. That's going to become our new reality increasingly as the years go by. See, Paul certainly wouldn't have been shocked in first century Corinth by what he encountered there. And I don't know that we should be shocked either. Saddened, Yes, but it's our reality, church, that we live in. And I think the answer for us as far as how we deal with issues of sex and human sexuality is something that uh, Barry Corey said. We need to have a firm core and soft edges. The firm core is we teach the truth. Church, we have no other teaching 
other than what Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 6 today, that we run away from sexual immorality, and that is any kind of sexual relationship, romantic relationship, outside of the bounds of a covenant relationship. And that is between a man and a woman, and we do not apologize for that. We teach the truth. We've got to be firm on our teaching. We teach the truth. But we've got to have soft edges. So if we're going to have a church like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, where we regularly see people who are struggling with sexual immorality, idolatry, adulterers, those who are having men who are having sex with men, if we're going to have that kind of church, we've got to create space to have relationships with people who are struggling with sexual sin. We've got to have soft enough edges that we allow people to get close enough to hear the truth. Think about Jesus. He was full of grace and truth, full of both. But man, he, he had soft edges. People could get close enough to Jesus to hear the truth. And if we're going to see people come to Christ and experience healing from sexual immorality, we've got to teach the truth firmly, but we've got to be open enough to build relationships with people who are really struggling. I think uh, David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons summed it up well in the book Good Faith. They said, we have to articulate a biblical vision of healthy sex and sexuality, and we must be willing to live out loud our love and belief in community with real people. God's household offers life after the sexual revolution. Thank God. But our idea of family must expand to make room for everyone who needs healing. The call this morning from God's word is to run away, but we want to help you run away. If there's anything that we can do for you this morning to help you run from sexual immorality in any form, we want to do that. We want to pray with you. We want to talk to you and understand that this is a, a sensitive topic, and so we can do that later. It doesn't have to be here. We will have people stationed around the room this morning if you would like to pray with somebody. It doesn't have to be a confession. It could be a praise. It doesn't have to be on this particular topic. It could be on anything. If you would like us to pray with you, to pray for you, or to praise God for something that's going on in your life, we would love to do that. Just please let your need be known, and Zach's going to sing a song to encourage you while we stand and while we sing. Lord, I come, I confess Maui. So teach my soul to rise.